good afternoon, everybody. This is your host, Guillermo Sabatier, on today's uh, Perspectives on Energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. And today we're going to talk about uh, the Marvel program from the DOE, uh, Micro Reactor Technology Moves to the Next Level. So, so anyway, um, again, welcome. I am the Director of uh, International Services for the Health and Safety Institute at hsi.com. So thank you for joining us. And uh, some pretty good news here when it comes to the development of uh, small and micro uh, modular reactor technology. And it looks like we finally are coalescing into a one unified design. And that's a lot of great news, but because then the next phase really is going to be testing. And once you have that testing, you are moving closer to uh, resolving a lot of the supply chain issues. Because uh, one of the things that really gets in the way in a, of uh, the economics of a lot of these different uh, nuclear programs is the fact that um, every design, every build is different, which of course then repeatability is lost. And then you have a problem with cost at that point. So if you can make these uh, processes, designs, and supply chains repeatable, you dramatically reduce the cost of every, every uh, Every project thereafter. All right. So again, this is this is uh, straight out of the uh, Department of Energy's uh, Office of Nuclear Energy Programs, Marvel, which is a an acronym I'll describe in a minute. But I think it's a pretty cool acronym. I'm sure somebody is a fan of some kind of science fiction and and so something else, and they probably force force retrofitted that to fit. But it sounds pretty exciting, right? And we'll talk about a couple of other items in there as well. Um, and this is important because I think it's the last episode I had, I talked about how the federal government's going to have to step in and help uh, move along some of these like designs and processes if we're ever going to meet these climate goals, as well as maintain a reliable system, right? Not to mention the fact that it, it's it's really impractical to try and build these uh, nuclear plants uh, Pretty much anywhere. So in this case, right, this this really opens the door to a lot of new possibilities. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Okay. So micro reactor program, right? So that this kind of a rendering of what that would look like. Um, and what Marvel stands for is micro reactor applications, research, validation, and evaluation. So really, what it is is that, is that we are now at a point where the design is pretty much pretty much well on its way. Now it's really the phase of testing and applications, right? So here, for example, one thing to remember, this is a very small modular, yeah, a very small modular reactor, right? So uh, really, uh, I should have changed that term small into micro because a lot of these reactors are not even beyond two megawatt capacity. It's actually rather small. And why is that really, right? And well, it has the capability to be able to test, right? So in this case, if we go ahead and zoom into that one slide and show it full screen, that'd be great. All right, so uh, thank you. So then in this case, for example, one of the applications here, and here's where it becomes really important, is this usually is smaller than what I normally have been discussing regarding SMRs, right? Here, you're even smaller still, like a remote community or a defense facility. And when I say defense facility, you're talking, you're talking about a base or an outpost or 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 some kind of like um, some some something related to to national defense that is in an area where that's quite isolated, right? And in a lot of cases, there's no transmission lines, or, or you want to have reliable power supplying that 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 particular facility, whether it's a a a myriad of different applications that we that come to mind when you when you, when you discuss uh, a defense facility, whether it's a uh, radar and early detection, uh, something to fire off munitions, or whether it's a forward base or something that is is being set up uh, ad hoc or rather quickly. That this particular application is really used for it. The other one, of course, is a mining site, and, and these are just one of many examples, right? So I'm just listing four of them here, but. The mining site becomes important in the sense that, remember, we're going to be mining a lot more uh, uh, different elements, precious metals, and, and different uh, minerals to be able to get into these like renewable resources. One of those, for example, are the, are the lithium mines. So a lot of these are actually uh, found in, in different new remote locations. So you can get to these sites and deploy one of these uh, sources without having to build an entire infrastructure behind it, like power lines, transmission lines, substations, and all that. To, to be able to supply that. 
Along with that, of course, comes backup power, right? So in a lot of cases, this could be the adequate backup power source for a, a generating facility or any other piece of large infrastructure that relies on something less than two megawatts of power that's you know highly portable. And of course, the last thing here is really, really interesting. And I think this is something that, for example, from the perspective of islands like Hawaii, the Hawaiian islands and all the other ones like the Balearic Islands, or even, for example, the Canary Islands, which we've seen a few examples of those, uh, having humanitarian assistance and disaster relief missions. In this case, these are also easily deployable and uh, allows for uh, having quick, quick power set up, especially after like a fall of fire or an earthquake or a storm or something of the sort, right? Where you actually able to deploy these rather quickly and to have uh, an, an area up and running again without having to build or rebuild all that other infrastructure that supports it, like transmission lines, distribution lines, substations, and all that. So, now, the other important thing here as well is that you look at that fourth major bullet there is that they have achieved, again, a 90% design completion. So that means at this point, right, they have um, pretty much agreed, right, on, on the uh, design philosophy and design protocols. So at this point, I mean, and they already have an actual working model that they're going to begin testing in Idaho National Labs. Uh, uh, and uh, that's very exciting because now once you're at that stage, now you're working out some of the kinks and problems, right? So it puts us a lot closer to that end goal of being able to actually field these devices. And of course, if these become successful, then scaling them up to something larger becomes a lot easier. Uh, then, of course, instead of just micro reactors like this one, you, know, you have small modular reactors that can then be deployed with, with greater ease. Sadly, I'm sure most of you have heard that new scale is just um, they had to pull out of a project they were building because just the ballooning costs, right? And when when a private company is well, they, when they went public, but you know it's it's investor owned, they're trying to actually fund these projects. It's very difficult to control this unless you have a larger government entity stepping in and doing that. Not to be said, not that you know, New Scale didn't receive uh, funding. They did receive quite a lot of funding from the federal government to develop this, but uh, again, a lot of cost that just ran away from them in this case. But um, the, I'm eager to see what they come up with next, hopefully, and they're able to manage those costs. So uh, the other important thing here is that we are now ready for testing. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So. All right, so and that is what the device looks like, right? So here you have the uh, primary coolant apparatus testing the, the device that's going to go into your, into your 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 um, into that that particular re reactor vessel, and you're going to see how they're going to combine these two together and run their cooling test. And of course, this is a sodium, potassium, and lead bismuth coolants, which is a little bit different than what we see in the past. And then these designs that, that tend to be a little bit safer, a lot safer, and then they have the ability to do a walk away meaning that if uh, left unattended, they would just basically um, uh, go back to a relaxed state in this case, right? Which is really helpful in, in this regard because then it allows for the deployment in facilities that are that are unattended, right? Uh, whether it's a container-sized device or something that's placed out there in a facility that's on the ground, there's not a lot of need to have people supervisor around. Of course, there's a lot of remote telemetry to uh, watch this, but there's no real need to have personnel operating these devices. Most of these are going to be automated or they're going to be operated remotely. But certainly there's going to be a lot of software involved in running these. So go on to the next slide, please. And the next slide is there we go. So now the more the boring part is going to have a lot of like uh so here, uh, what is the DOE micro reactor program? So the project goal here is to actually have a 100 kilowatt efficient reactor that researchers and technology developers to gain operational experience with real micro reactor to uh, experience having maturity and enable new micro reactor applications. So the whole point of this really is to actually help the industry, help the facilitate the development of these devices, right? So uh, this Marvel project goal is ultimately, what they're trying to do is ideally is to coalesce into one accepted approved design and the whole purpose really is to actually have the economies of scale where well, you can then mass produce these things at a much lower cost uh, having to do a one-off here one off there with different design spe specs makes them makes each of them really really expensive so once you have a generalized accepted design that's repeatable so then the, the first one costs a lot of money but then the second one will probably cost half as much and then the one after that costs half as much so you're going to have this like this the uh, 
arithmetic progression of a price, right? As as you look as each each unit is being developed, eventually you will reach a point that the um, the cost for every particular facility is going to be much less than the than the previous one. So ultimately, you can expect to see hundreds, if not thousands, of these deployed, ideally throughout the country at some point. Right? So. So what is Marvel, right? Uh, again, it's part of the Idaho National Labs, uh, and they're, they're applying research and development to that particular treat program, which is part of their um, ongoing process to develop fuels, develop operations, and ma to make sure that the concept of design can be licensed and deployed by commercial entities. So the whole point is really they're trying to stimulate, motivate, assist, and facilitate, right, the development of these technologies. So uh, once again, you know, it's a pretty good move by the Department of Energy and the federal government to go ahead and make that happen and help accelerate this because really the main motivator behind this is, is not just reliability, but to me, that would be the main motivator. But, but really it's also that coupled with the fact that, you know, this is the one um, carbon, carbon, carbon zero, true zero carbon uh, resource as it generates, you know, electricity. Uh, the other thing that's important as well to me is that the fact that, you know, when it, when there's reliability, you have dispatchability, and uh, nuclear is still at a point where it costs far less to develop even than solar. So uh, when you look at, at it per megawatt, um, so that's an important thing to consider, right, as they develop these uh, projects um, a lot further. Now, of course, we're, only, we're maybe like two years away from the first commercial design. But two years is so uh, is is a, is a lot better than what it was a, a while back. So this is definitely a really important milestone to get here, right? So again, uh, once the general design is agreed upon, uh, as I said earlier, right, uh, you'll you'll see this design and the, this implementation cost being reduced, and you'll see widespread adoption and deployment. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. So uh, what can be enabled by the, Mar by the Marvel operation, right? So the whole point of it here is, is to demonstrate and address issues related to installation, right? So here they're trying to figure out, all right, they're trying to work out the problems. They're trying to design, uh, apply the design, and then maybe fine tune it at this point, right? So they're going to see, for example, uh, improve the process of when it comes to citing approval or review. So that's usually another, another typical pretty, Typically, large or, or tall hurdle for a lot of these nuclear, nuclear developers to actually get across. So uh, the startup methodology. So uh, the other thing that's important here, right, is the um, start starting up a reactor in this case, not just from the process of the designing it and building it, but also actually running it and operating it. Right. Uh, the other important thing here is normal operating transients, the startup and load management. So that's an important thing because startup, of course, implies that you're going to cycle this unit off and on. And load management to me is even more important. That means, of course, that now you're going to dispatch the unit as needed for load management, which of course, that's one of the things that really is, is really, really concerning when it comes to having a renewable, variable renewable energy uh, resources in your portfolio. Uh, solar and wind prove to be very, very, very variable. And nobody, I mean, one of the quick dirty solutions really is to curtail their output, but that's, you know, now you're now you're you're wasting that capitalized expenditure that you that you invested initially, and then you by pretty much uh, limiting the output of these resources. So if you can allow those those variable resources to run as needed, and then you can redispatch these other base base load or these thousands of little micro reactors, then you are definitely position that a much uh, more reliable posture when it comes to operating the grid, right? Uh, the other important thing to verify and test here, which is something that I've always had a concern with, of course, is cyber and physical security hardening, right? So these devices, of course, they'll be left out there in remote areas away from supervision. In a lot of cases, I mean, direct supervision, but they will have a lot of monitoring and equipment and barriers in place, physical and cybersecurity barriers. But again, this is a good time to go ahead and test those. and. Um, Definitely uh, something to look forward to when it comes to that being uh, proof of concept being proven, being verified in this case. Uh, the other thing, of course, is uh, what I was saying earlier, right? The real net zero electrical microgrid, right? So here, for example, we're, we're we're looking at deploying a resource that once deployed is not going to create any any uh, 
you're not going to affect your carbon footprint, right? This is like a real zero resource where it's not an offset. It's nothing of the sort. It's, it's producing clean energy in this case, right? Um, and uh, that is something that is important to, to reach our climate goals. The last thing, of course, is uh, you're using the, uh, you're testing and you're showing the, the use of the high, the low grade heat extraction to gain operational experience. So this is the important, this other important thing is, is when it comes to industrial applications, right? Don't forget, you're also producing a lot of heat. And uh, this heat, of course, part of, part of it is being used to uh, generate electricity, but uh, you know, there's also applicability for industrial processes. So this can be coupled together with, uh, with any type of industrial facility that requires a lot of heat, heat transfer, or heat energy to be able to carry out their operations. So definitely really helpful in this regard. Let's go ahead and look at the next slide. I think it's a line. There we go. So uh, autonomous operation technologies, right? That's an important thing as well. So these devices, there are going to be so many of them uh, that, uh, deployed out there that for, for them to actually... Uh, uh, you, you eliminate operator functions while maintaining reactor safety. So in this case, a lot of these are, are going to be self-governed. Uh, they're going to have a lot of automated systems. And uh, these automated operator functions, right, it, it's going to, of course, um, the goal of these is, is to, of course, improve safety, while at the same time responding rather quickly to the uh, low demands of the grid, right? Um, the other thing that's also interesting in this regard of, as well is also uh, radiation. Is this still a nuclear resource? So you're going to make sure you manage uh, any potential issues with nuclear, with, with anything being irradiated, right? And, and that's part of that. Part of this process here is to test the sensors, test all, all of the reliability when it comes to maintaining the safety of these devices. But part of that is being looked at on this particular phase of the program. And of course, right, uh, uh, there's a lot of simulation in this case. So uh, here, for example, they're creating a live data, a digital sort of the reactor to train an artificial, an AI-based control system. So a lot of these resources are, are going to be based on some kind of AI type of like algorithm to go ahead and not just each individual device, but also all of them acting together as an aggregator in concert to, uh, again, uh, behave in a way that'll, that'll, that'll improve or maintain system reliability, right? And of course, the last one thing, of course, is to demonstrate wireless transmissions of live data to both electrical and thermal power output during startup. So one of the things that's important here, of course, is that communications. Uh, usually these devices that we place in areas that may not necessarily have uh, fiber or data connectivity. Uh, they may be connected to something that they're feeding locally, they, but they more, more than likely will not be connected to any grid, any distribution network. So for them having wireless or maybe satellite communications will be important. And this will be what something that they will be testing in this regard as well. All right, what is the next uh, slide? Okay, so um, the next one is seamless application integration, right? So in this case, uh, the the ability to go ahead and uh, one of the things that they'll be able to do, of course, is provide inertia, provide reliability. They'll be able to operate with the grid, and of course, they'll be able to respond to load, respond to frequency, respond to voltage, and those different applications as needed, right? Because uh, uh, re reliability requires demands, right? That that we respond to changes. Uh, whether it's a load uh, response be or it's something that changes from from a day to day. Seasonal changes as well, and uh, for example, in just the, just the yesterday, there there was a report that we are looking at being at a greater risk of having power disruptions this this winter, just because of the fact that we have so much variability with our renewable resources and not a lot of uh, base load that's easily dispatchable. So again, this is something that could definitely have an impact on that, and um, and a coupled with distributed energy resources, virtual power plants, and a whole array of things. Uh, th this will be probably another component in our rapidly evolving grid uh, of the future in this case, right? And the last thing here, of course, is uh, so many different applications, right, um, that we can use for um, both power management and uh, also load management approaches. In this case, the things that I'm most excited about is the fact that, you know, we'll be able to maintain grid reliability and uh, while also supplying these, these far-off uh, areas that could be really isolated or of course also maybe even improve the possibility of uh 
having these like smaller communities that are in rural areas that ha have their own distribution network or part of these co-ops uh, that, for example, don't necessarily want to build more transmission, but you can connect these to the distribution grid. And in this case, right, you'd have a small a small reactor that's, that's the same thing as a small diesel generator producing maybe 12, 20, 50 uh, uh, kilowatts. That, that in this case, you know, powers a few a few buildings, and rather rather important. So, you know, in a lot of cases, for example, think of a remote hospital in a remote facility. Well, the, these would be ideal for that sort of a situation, or something, for example, in the Arctic or the Antarctic. That would be another application to be really really useful. Now, as far as deploying these in places like Hawaii, um, I see the definite benefits here, but there could be, for example, challenges and pushback regarding uh, um, some kind of environmental impact. Well, this is why that's what this testing is for in this regard, and hopefully that can be worked out and their their application, the value of their application can be seen in this regard as not the end all be all, but just one more component to add to that portfolio of uh, real zero uh, energy sources. And I think that is all we have as far as presentations go. Uh, this uh, next time we we talking about the uh, halo type of uh, nuclear fuel that's also being developed along with this. Uh, normally, we have uh, three to five percent uh, uranium enriched uh, nuclear fuel. The halo runs at about fifteen to twenty percent enrichment, which is a lot more efficient. Now, mind you, this is not weapons grade uranium. Uh, uranium right that, that's usually like above 90 percent so th that's not what this is right? Haiti is just something that, that'll be more efficient and there's other places in the world that already recycle some of this nuclear waste and they use it for again to extend the life of some of these resources so that's something that could be done here with, with these like halo type of fuel so we'll talk some more about that next time but that is something that may that will be looked at when it comes to this particular fuel resource so again, this is uh, the Marvel program brought to, brought to you by the DOE and the being tested right now at the Idaho National Labs. So again, this great milestone is a really, um, really exciting news for, for all of us in the industry and uh, especially when it comes to nuclear generation. So and again, thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions or want to, have, uh, want to say, leave a comment below. I'll, I'll try and get back to you as soon as we can. But uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Have yourselves a great day. Thank you.